speaker series this morning. Welcome to the virtual East Harlem School. And uh, we will start with Tracy, as she always does, leading a moment of silence. One, two, three. One, two, three. Thanks, Tracy. One of those days, um, terrified um, because I am the oldest fanboy of Sasha Cohen, um, but you have millions of admirers throughout the world. Um, but I also tremble because um, I think what the school would have been uh, without Devin, who brought you to us, behind every great woman is a great woman, uh, behind every great Olympian um, are people like Devin, who uh, brought wonderful lights to our school throughout the summer of the pandemic. And now here at the edge, the beginning of the end, um, we have an Olympian. Um, Sasha Cohen, people have already read your resume, but I will briefly uh, summarize what you've done, which is nothing short of Olympian, both literally and metaphorically. You're a two-time Olympian and Olympic silver medalist, a three-time world medalist, Grand Prix final champion, U.S. champion, and you are a member of the U.S. Figure Skating Hall of Fame. And it's not just um, you have a body, not just uh, excellence in sports, but the ancient Greek uh, aspiration of having um, a strong mind and a powerful body. You graduated magna cum laude from uh, Columbia University with a degree in, in political science. And now you are Morgan Stanley in investment management as a disruptive change analyst. And I don't know uh, what this has been except disruptive change. So you'll help us understand this crazy world we're in um, with your remarks. Um, but I do want to say it is, it is an Olympic challenge to introduce an Olympian. Um, what you've gone through, the beautiful film that you participated in, The Weight of Gold. Um, so beyond uh, the G-forces and explosive and high art of figure skating, um, you've dealt with epic trauma, stress, and striving to reach uh, the heights that you have reached. And then you found excellence in the worlds beyond uh, to prepare for this. And I wanna get you on, but um, I do wanna say when I was trying to understand how to explain you and, and your life and, and people, uh, the very few people in the world to attain your heights, I was, drawn to uh, an expression uh, of some words by um, William Shakespeare, um, who um, said this, there is a, a tide and forgive the gender language, but there is a tide in the affairs of men, which taken at the flood leads on to fortune, omitted all the voyage of their life is bound in shallow shallows and miseries. So kids, you know, that there's a time in, in, in human lives, um, which if they take on the flood, it leads on to fortune. But most people in the voyages of their life, they're bound in shallows and mi miseries. They don't embark on such a voyage. So on such a full sea, we are now afloat. Uh, Olympians like Sasha Cohen have embarked on this full sea of challenge and effort and austerity. Um, and it finishes up the quotation, we must take the current when it serves or lose all our ventures. And this is what, um, what Sasha Cohen has done. She put everything on the line. She um, was so kind and, and, um, and wonderful in the green room. She, but she talked uh, parenthetically about having given up the social life that basically everybody else has in school. And she was homeschooled so she could embark on, on such a full sea, even though that full sea was covered in hard ice um, where she would explode into um, 
balletic figures and then land again um, balanced. And then she's uh, you know gone into an Olympian career and then landed in the world of the Ivy League and now into the world of analyzing change um, in, in the markets and in the world and trying to make sense of it. Um, but uh, what a pleasure, Devin, thank you so much for bringing uh, somebody who's not merely an Olympian. And for me, uh, growing up, you're know, the highest level of achievement uh, for anybody would be somebody who made it to the Olympics, but um, she's created a beautiful life amidst all the austerity and trauma and, and sacrifice. So it is my great pleasure to thank Devin once again for bringing our wonderful speaker, Sasha Cole. Thank you, that's, uh, that's such a nice intro. I'm not sure I can add too much to that, um, but thank you so much for having me on today. Um, Devin, thank you so much for inviting me and introducing me to such a wonderful community and school. I, I really miss getting to speak to students and kind of shift back into that frame of mind. Remember what my life was like at your age and just how important school was for me to cultivate um, who I was outside of being an athlete. And I feel like you guys are so lucky getting to do that now at this age. For me, I was so focused on, on one thing, which was figure skating, that it wasn't until I was 26 and went started college um, quite a few years late that I began to become immersed in history and poetry and art and philosophy and discover a world outside of an ice rink. And I found it to be such a gift. Um, so I'm really excited that you guys are all getting to do that right now. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about my life, and I heard that some of you or most of you have watched The Weight of Gold, which I think is such an important project because mental health is, um, is a big issue today, and a lot of times people aren't comfortable talking about it, and especially in the world of athletics where you don't want to admit failure, you don't want to admit weakness, you don't want to admit any struggle because you want to show the world that you're strong. You want to show yourself that you're strong. And so this documentary was in the works for three or four years before it finally found a home on HBO. And I think it's just really important that everybody knows that even amazing Olympians like Michael Phelps and Sean White, who have won multiple Olympic games, are still really struggling with their identities of who they are when they no longer compete. And what it's like to deal with the highs and lows of sport. You know, there's probably nothing more incredible than getting to go to an Olympic games and winning a medal for your country, but then you go home and there's this amazing void and sense of emptiness. And, you know, there's, the world has focused on the next thing and you're still kind of struggling to figure out who you are and what you do when you no longer do your sport. Um, but I'm going to talk a little bit of, you know, going back to the beginning when I was a little crazy kid and where it all began, please feel free to interrupt, ask questions along the way. And then, of course, at the end, anything that I can answer, I'd love to, to chat with you about. Um, so I think you guys know a little bit about figure skating. Um, it's a sport with um, very, very sharp knives attached to the bottom of your feet. <laughs> where you skate over the ice and you try very hard not to fall because you can break tailbones and um, you, you can have people skate through you. I've had someone land a jump in my leg, which led to 21 stitches in my calf. Um, I've landed on my own hand and have a scar here, slid through light bulbs here. Uh, I've broken my back, two torn meniscus, menisci. Um, so it's kind of part of the the sports world, um, especially when you're skating around really fast with blades on your feet. Uh, but I think in a bigger context, you know, skating is just one example of sport and sport is one example of things in our lives that give us really meaningful personal experiences. And that can be both extreme struggle and extreme success. And ultimately those are the kind of experiences that shape us. If you've read my bio or Wikipedia, you know that I represented the US. I competed in two Olympic games. And for me, it really began quite early. 
competitive life was all consuming. And that's what I spent my childhood and my teenage years doing. And I was homeschooled since seventh grade. I told my mom one day in the car, because we would go to the rink early in the morning, go to school, go to the rink after skate, go to the rink after school. And I just realized that if I wanted to have a shot at my dream, I needed to be at the rink all day. And I needed to make that the priority. And I was lucky that my mom listened to a 12 year old and she, she gave me a shot at that. And, but ultimately I say, it's, it looks like a lot of sacrifice and it certainly was, but in that moment and at that time in my life, that that's the only place that I wanted to be was at the rink precisely crafting my training regimens and focusing on my choreography and working on my jumps and spins to really think about the world's the next year and the Olympics four years away and the next Olympics eight years away. And I would mark my calendar um, on these huge timelines of counting down. The Olympics are in 562 days. Um, so it was a, a very intense and focused way of living. And that, that certainly certainly shaped me. But I started skating at seven. Before that, at the age of five, my parents put me in gymnastics because I was so wild and crazy. I would just climb everything in the house. I would play with the pots and pans. I'd climb trees and I just had so much energy that they didn't know what to do with me. So they put me in gymnastics for three hours a day and that used up my energy. And so I came home and was a very well-behaved kid and, and two years later, gymnastics led to figure skating. And I fell in love with this whirlwind feeling I got when I was gliding on the ice. And I, I started a little late in skating because most figure skaters that are very competitive start at the age of four or five. And it wasn't promising. I fell all the time. I was a very slow learner. I had no attention span and I was way behind my peers. And Skating is a little bit clicky in the sense that if you start late and you can't do the same tricks as the other kids, they don't want to hang out with you. And so I was a little bit ostracized in the beginning. Um, everyone thought of me as this crazy little girl who didn't have that much coordination and got in everyone's way when they were trying to practice their routine. And I actually became quite famous at my rink because I managed to knock over five of my coaches during lessons because I didn't see them. <laughs> and I would run into them when I was skating backwards and they'd fall over. Um, so that was, that was not a great start, uh, but I loved it. I relentlessly toiled away and with a good deal of patience and hard work, I slowly began to improve. I caught up with the other kids. And, and then that if I fast forward to seventh grade, that's when I decided to be homeschooled so I could dedicate all my time to training. And that's when I really knew that early in life, you have to choose and you can't be great at everything and you have to choose what you love. And sometimes choosing what you love also means saying no to other things. Um, and I guess for me, it wasn't too difficult of a decision because I don't think I fit in very well in elementary school and middle school. I think I was a foot shorter than everyone else. Everyone called me the little runt. And I was just still this little wild kid that was always climbing trees. And, and so I, I just knew that I wanted to be skating and that's, that's where I belonged, which was in the rink. So I started skating six days a week and then I'd go to ballet, I'd go to the gym, I'd go to physical therapy. Um, and then I would start listening to music to pick for a program. And then I'd watch skating videos at night and watch, you know, the greats like Scott Hamilton and Christian Yamaguchi and watch their choreography and look at their costumes. And it was really my, my whole entire life. Um, and, and through that, I, I learned a lot about myself. It taught me really to be independent, resilient, self-analytical, and also the importance of believing myself and, and setting and committing to a goal, uh, you know, you have this wonderful team of people that supports you, helping you pick your programs and learn new jumps. But ultimately when you have to go out by yourself in a little costume and a freezing ice rink and see everyone staring at you and nine judges, um, you know, it, it takes, some, takes some nerves of steel and some gumption to be able to hold your ground and to breathe and move through it and, and trust through your training. And I think 
because I started doing that at such a young age at a small local level, that's what enabled me to continue to do it up until the Olympic level. Because I found that later in my life, when I took a few years off and came back, I was 25 and I could remember physically exactly what it felt like. And I was like, wow, I'm not cut out for this anymore. And it, it really felt like a thousand pounds of pressure on your, on your chest and like battery acid running through your, your veins. It was just this overwhelming sense of nerves and pressure. And, and my way of handling it was really to, to focus on the moment because I think so much of when we worry is because we're trying to do everything in our heads of things that are happening six months from now. And we're trying to take the weight of the world on and process it all in real time. And so it may seem silly, but my trick was just to keep it really simple. So the day that I competed at the Olympics, I told myself, you know, all you have to do right now is put on your pants, just put on your pants, you know? Okay, good success. Pants are on now, now your shoes, like, good job. Like, look, you know, and then one step after another, I made it to the Olympic arena. I warmed up, changed into my costume. I tied my laces got onto the ice and then you just kind of break life down into these manageable little chunks. And it's, it's very reassuring for the mind. Um, Cause you can really only do one thing at a time. Well, and we try to do everything at once. Um, so if putting on pants is helpful to anyone, if they have a big test coming up, um, let me know. <laughs> so, as I said, you know, there was one big kind of traumatic event earlier in my life when someone landed a jump in my leg. I was 12 years old and starting to advance on the national level. And all of a sudden, it looked like someone took a melon baller and scooped out a big chunk of my calf. I was on crutches for two and a half months and it was unclear if I would skate again. And injuries are probably one of the toughest things in sports because athletes are used to being in control. We're used to setting our training schedules and pushing ourselves. And if we don't push ourselves, we feel like we're being weak, but in, but injuries are one of those one of those things, those fine lines that if you push yourself, uh, you'll actually get worse and set yourself further back. And so you have to have this battle between the two parts of your mind, the one that says like, you need to be on the ice, you need to be practicing, and the rational voice that's listening to your doctors and you know that you have to heal. Um, so that was, that was a really tough time for me because it was unclear if I would be able to skate again. I was lucky that the injury just nicked my muscle and didn't go through it because if my calf had been sliced in half, I don't think I would have been able to skate again. Um, just kind of going back and remembering that time. Um, it was funny because my skating leggings were not even cut. It was a very blunt injury and it looked like someone took a, a melon baller and just like scooped out a ball in my calf so that sorry to get a little bit graphic there I'm just remembering <laughs> all the details of that um you know but ultimately um these all led me to my my all, all these experiences led me to my first olympic games and i had decided to take one two classes in my senior year in high school and go to prom but i made my first olympic games after coming back from a pretty bad back injury in 2002 uh, and was able to represent my country in my own home country just a few months after 9-11, um, which was a very emotional um, and special event for me, getting to compete in Utah, having my family and friends come to support and cheer for me and getting to go to my first Olympic Games. And the Olympics are pretty spectacular and different than any other event that athletes go to because we're not just going to our world championships and meeting other figure skaters all of a sudden we're meeting bobsledders and curlers and skiers and speed skaters and athletes we've never met before from all different parts of the world and so the the olympic village is is this pretty magical place and this like melting pot of energies and I'll say that the figure skaters are generally the only ones that wear makeup 
<laughs> everyone else tells how you can generally spot a figure skater um sparkles and makeup um some of these stereotypes actually come from a little bit of truth but it was it was magic for me and coming out of that games there was certainly disappointment i had just missed the podium i was um fourth and that really motivated me to recommit and to focus four years away on another olympic games in torino in 2006 and the first two years were amazing of training i was winning many of the competitions and felt great and then all of a sudden like happens in sport but no one talks about it at the time you have these difficulties of training where you know i lost all my jumps i had to withdraw from a season of competitions and it was unclear if i would get them back you know i tinkered with my boots i tinkered with my blades i changed my coaches and there's a lot of searching and unknown and you feel like you kind of lost you lost what it was that made you good what made you competitive and then that happens first physically and then mentally you begin to question and doubt everything and I think that was again one of the really tough times because I didn't know if I could hang in for another two years to continue to train and be competitive and go to a second Olympic Games um, so that was a really tough time in my life I ultimately took a little bit of time off spent time with family came back to my old coach and recommitted um, to training again and finally made my second Olympic Games by winning the U.S. Nationals um, and won a silver medal at the Torino Olympics in 2006. And again, it was one of those bittersweet moments where I was first going into the short program, um, first after the short program, going into the long program. And it was just magical, you know, just magical. But again, the nature of sport, I was dealing with injuries. And I fell a few times in my long program, as also happens on the ice, as some other people did that night. Um, you know, but ultimately, I've had many years to look back on that time and that experience. And in total, when you when you have that chance to look back, you have these little regrets and these moments and these what ifs, what if I did this and what if I did that? But I'll say if anything, my regret was I didn't enjoy the moments more. You know, I've, I've been a very focused person. So I missed opening ceremonies to train and you know, just thinking about my programs over and over. And you forget a little bit just what the magic of Olympic games is, the whole world pausing for a second the world tuning in and athletes around the world from different circumstances, overcoming different challenges, coming together to celebrate what they've been dedicating their whole lives to and for. And it's very different than professional sports. Um, we watch basketball or football on TV, we're very well paid, have a ton of fans year round that are tuning into what they do. But Olympians, we, we train a little bit in obscurity and every four years, the world pays attention and there's this magic and energy to it. And so getting to celebrate making one, you know, two Olympics and how special that was and the people that I met along the way that were very similar to, to myself, that they were very focused and their sport was more important than anything else. And to share that kind of experience with them at an event like the Olympics was very special looking back. But of course, when you're 17 and you're 21, you're not very wise. And so <laughs> you kind of realize this as you get a little bit, a little bit further out. Um, but I'll, I'll pause there and, you know, I can certainly chat a little bit more generally, but I know um, it's, it's always more fun to ask and answer specific questions. So please let me know if I can do that for anybody at this time. Thank you so much, Sasha. That was so wonderful. And, and yes, we have so many questions we'd love to ask you. Um, we'll start with Catherine, who has your first question. Hi, good morning. I would like to thank you for being our virtual speaker today. You're welcome. Thank you for coming on and asking the first question. I know that's, that's never easy. <laughs> 
I read that after the Olympics, some athletes lose their passion for their sport. Some suffer from the ongoing pressure they receive to give an astounding performance. My question for you is, what do you think needs to be improved about the preparation for the Olympics in order to reduce these pressures and their impact on an athlete's mental health? I think that's a tough question. I think everyone handles it a little bit differently, but I think a big part of it is you start a sport and you know, you're starting as a seven-year-old or a five-year-old and it's just fun, right? So what brings you in is the joy of learning something new and improving every day. And then I think once you've done it for 10 years or 15 years, you've been through many injuries, burnout and disappointing um, competitions, and you have to find a strength deep within and a love of what you're doing. Um, and whether that's knowing that you can be better and figuring out how you can get there or knowing that you just, you love to perform and you love the Olympic competitive stage. Um, but in terms of, I think as one gets older and matures a little bit, you kind of realize that you will retire at some point and it may be your choice, it may not be. Um, you know, it's not like someone that has a whole work career, 60, 70, decides, okay, I'm, I'm done now. Many athletes, especially even gymnasts and figure skaters are done at the age of 16. And it's very hard to deal with being the best at something and then knowing you're just getting worse from there and then trying to start over um, so young in life. And so I think awareness and resources around um, kind of what a sport can do for you as a person and how you can use that as a stepping stone or a bridge into your life after sports, because ultimately that's going to be the much bigger chunk of your life. And that's going to be where you actually create your identity outside your sport. Um, I've always said that for 20 years, everyone saw me and to some extent they still do. Oh, you're just Sasha, the ice skater and tell me about your ice skating. And, and, and that was it. And so I never really got to, to like, am I interested in history? Am I interested in science? And I never got to ask those important questions. And I think once athletes leave their sport and start asking those questions about themselves, they'll realize that they're more than their sport. And I think that's really important to deal with depression and the pressure and the transition is even though you're closing one door on a competitive career and leaving that behind, you realize that you have so many other doors to open and to explore and really the rest of your life to do that. But it always is a little hard when you watch the Olympics every four, you know, every day, the summer and winter every two years and and see those athletes and remember that moment and how exciting it was because those moments are gone but there are many other good ones to to come in to replace them thank you so much for that and um our next question comes from Yuritsi. it's actually kind of a follow-up to what you were just saying if that's okay here's Yuritsi. hi good morning in the morning. documentary the weight of gold a lot of Olympians mentioned that they did not know who they were as a person outside of being an athlete. My question for you is, what did you learn about yourself and who you are outside of being a figure skater after the Olympics? The first thing that I learned was how nice life was when you weren't competing. It was very even, you know, you would kind of wake up every day maybe you could sleep in a little bit there what there wasn't this intense weight of pressure of knowing that you needed to be your best in four years and were you doing everything right today to get there um and so the highs and lows were gone and at first that was very nice you know the first year and then I really began to miss the purpose and the meaning that had really driven my life and directed it for the first, you know, 15 years. And it led to this continual search of what else in life outside of sports can give me that feeling. And I find it every now and again, and it certainly has a different shape. Um, but I think especially I was a solo athlete and figure skating, ladies figure skating is really highlighted in the Olympic games. And there's a lot of pressure and we tend to have shorter careers than 
you know, some of the other athletes. And I think I found that being able to share my story and being able to untangle the web of thoughts in my head, put them on paper and to write an op-ed in the New York Times in Sports Illustrated about what that experience feels like inside and then get the reaction and responses from people that read it. Because all of a sudden, having felt alone and you know in the spotlight for so long, I felt like I was connected to the readers, to the people that were watching skating. And I could explain all the feelings that I'd had for those 20 years. Um, and so the sense of community, which I don't think I had um, so much when I was competing and have found through having a voice um, has been incredibly meaningful. And so I'm always looking for platforms and opportunities to get to share and connect with people because it's not just, you know, not just figure skating, it's sports and it's not just sports. It's much bigger than that when you perhaps lose a loved one or you retire or you have this big transition in your life and you're dealing with some kind of identity loss. Um, you know, people feel ungrounded and kind of have to ask the big question again. Sorry about that. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, we'll go to our next question. It comes from Sophia. Hi, good morning. Hi. I learned that you are an alumna of Columbia University. So what inspired your decision to pursue a college degree after the Olympics? After I was finished competing, I was I toured. And so that's basically like, you know, going to different arenas around the country, doing the same show every night. Um, and it was really fun at first. And then it, it felt a little bit like I was, you know, it was Groundhog Day. Um, you go into like the bottom of another kind of unmarked arena, you put on the same costume, you do the same show and you do it a hundred times. And when I was home practicing for it, I would spend a lot of time in my public library and I would check out um, books on tape. And I particularly checked out many of the different great courses. It's um, a brand of different lectures, I think that have been recorded by professors. And since I was always driving, to different rinks and training centers or spending a lot of time warming up, I would listen. And, um, you know, I listened to different lectures on like philosophy by Nietzsche and different like, time epics in history, like 17th century European history. And when I was doing that for about a year and a half, I'm like maybe it's time for me to, to go back to school. Um, and, and so, I, be, I began to apply to different colleges and I knew I wanted to be in New York City. New York had my heart, especially going to school a little bit later in life. Um, I, I felt like the traditional on-campus experience for an 18-year-old, sorry, that's my, my one-year-old. He's screaming that he probably doesn't like his breakfast. Um, and I, I realized that I had to be in New York and I, I wanted not only Columbia, but I wanted the city. And so that that gave me both. Um, and I had the most magical time there. You know, the campus is not that far away from your campus. And when I first walked, you know, through and saw the different buildings and the sculptures and the libraries, I just I fell in love with it and studying on the steps and everything that I was exposed to. And probably equally as important is I'm not sure if anyone's heard of a program called General Studies at Columbia. Um, but Eisenhower created that for returning uh, veterans, I think after World War II, basically to give a opportunity to people with non-traditional experiences to come back and get a college education. And so many of these people were older, um, maybe they'd had a family before or were dancers or veterans and had spent the earlier part of their life on a non-traditional track, but still were very interested in, in having that college experience and having it with in a traditional way with um, you know other 18 year olds and great professors and so that's what led me to Columbia and I had the most fantastic time and I guess the one piece of advice I'll share is use use that time to explore all your interests there's so many incredible 
classes. And I was so actually sad when I graduated because there were so many classes that I wanted to take that I'd never had a chance to take. I was always auditing 10 classes and then narrowing it down to four or five every semester. But I have, I have very fond memories of Columbia. It was a, a great time in my life. Thank you so much. Um, we actually do have a sort of a follow-up question to that um, coming from Alexa. Hi, good morning. I learned that when you attempt to Columbia University, you major in, in political science. What do you choose to pursue this field of study? So there, I guess if I'm gonna be completely honest, there are two parts to that. One, I think I was, I was really fascinated how political science was really a narrative woven over world history. Um, and so I felt like I'd spent so much time with my head under a rock in an ice rink that I wasn't very informed about world events and policy and just really understanding, you know, how to read a newspaper and what's happening in the world and everything that led to a certain event that you're reading about today had years and years of history behind it. And so I felt by taking, um, by choosing to major in political science and international relations um, was my kind of more specific major. It really opened up my eyes to understand how the world developed, how wars had unfolded over time, and then just kind of cultural differences in the US, in Europe, in Africa, in Asia, and how these cultural differences really affected policy. And then part two of why I chose that was political science required the least number of credits, which allowed me to take more classes across philosophy and poetry and drawing and all these other subjects I was fascinated by. Um, so that's my, my two-part answer. That's great, thank you so much. Um, our next question comes from Zaida, who you met in the green room earlier, who is also a figure skater. <laughs> Hi, good morning. Um, I would like to continue on the figure skating path. As an experienced figure skater, what are some healthy habits that every skater or athlete should have in order to be successful? And also, what are your tips on overcoming anxiety before a performance? I think trusting your training and being organized about how you approach the event that you're trying to be your best at, you know, whether that's a competition or a show or performance and, and then breaking it down into little steps and knowing what every day of training looks like, because that's a manageable chunk that you can control and you can wake up in the morning and say, okay, today I want to run sprints so that I can improve my stamina. I want to spend, you know, 30 minutes or however long stretching and I want to do the run through of my program in this way. And you can kind of outline these schedules for yourself. And then every day you can go home knowing that you accomplished, you had a goal and you accomplished that goal instead of having this vague, overwhelming, like I want to be really good in four years, but I'm not sure how to do that and, and how to get there. I found, I found that breaking my training down into to daily chunks was a really manageable and measurable way to do that, which was not only important for my body, but for your mind. Because in a sport, you can't train all day. Your body can't handle that. So you have to know that you did exactly what you set out to do and your mind can rest knowing that you're, you're on track. And then in terms of handling nerves, I think again, in its own way, just focusing on the moment and trusting your body. And I think the way that you can do that is, you know, your mind, you can't use all parts of your mind at once. And so you, you can let the worrier run wild, which can, you know, worry about okay, what's going to happen in an hour. And am I going to land this? Am I going to fall? What's going to happen? Um, or you can keep it really concrete and say, okay, I'm going to put on my headphones. Uh, right now I'm going to jog and warm up and then I'm gonna stretch. And I think when you continue to channel your thoughts and your focus on what you need to do right now, that prevents you from running away and worrying 
a little bit later. Um, and then finally, there's a lot of fake it till you make it. So it's putting a smile on your face, breathing. And I would say that that works 60, 70% of the time. <laughs> so it's more effective than it might seem. That's great advice. Thank you. <laughs> we'll go next to Tracy, who you also met this morning. Hello. Good morning. Um, so what has been the best piece of advice that you received throughout your athletic career and that has mo had the most impact on you? I think it's really the message of perspective and persistence. I think I'm a very emotional person. And so how I feel in the moment or how that day's training is going really colored my lens and how I felt. And so if I was skating badly or falling a lot, I'm like, this is over. I'll never be able to do it. And I catastrophize and it would really get me down. Um, and so I think having coaches that were able to help me redirect and be like, that's right. We're going to leave that. We're going to work on spins and we're going to work on your program um, and come back and show up tomorrow. And, and so I think that was the biggest thing is you come back every day and you show up no matter how you feel. Um, because the biggest thing that I've kind of put together over my career is that nine out of 10 days, you don't feel great. You know, that day once in a while you're on fire and everything's easy and you're happy and your body feels great. Those days are not the norm. Most of the time you're waking up and you know you crack your back three or four times. You like slowly roll on your side and get out of bed. You take to a leave and you try to get the body moving again. And it's tough, um, but pushing through those days and coming home at the end of the day, knowing that the day wasn't easy, but you did what you set out to do. Um, those are the kind of days I think that give you confidence and allow you to have a longer term career, because I think it's this gap between expectations and reality that really define our lives. And it's not only in sport, but in academics and in our careers, in our friendships and our relationships. And if you can go in knowing that it's going to be difficult, but that you're going to show up and you're gonna have a good attitude and you're gonna find ways to, to make it work. I think ultimately though stacking up those days are the days that really make a difference. Um, Sasha, we wanna be mindful of your time this morning. Do you have time for two more questions? Yeah, absolutely. Great, okay, great. We'll go to Sori next. Hi. I learned that you're 22 years old and you competed in your first Olympics. If you could go back and give your 22 year old self some words of encouragement in the moments leading up to your performance in the Olympics, what would you say and why? So my first Olympics, I was actually 17 and my second one, I was 21. Um, it's a good question. What are my words of advice? Um, I, I remember Actually, actually just being pretty, pretty distracted because at that point, you know, it was right after 9-11. And so to get into the arena, you had to go through three security checks and they would take out your whole bag, empty out your skates, your costume, and do this like three times going in. And when I got through, got into the arena, did my warm up, there's five minutes left before we have to get on the ice, I'm getting dressed. And I realized there are no tights in my suitcase. And if you guys watch figure skating, tights are very important. Um, <laughs> you need to have tights. And, and so I ended up having to borrow tights from a Japanese skater that had just finished um, in like a panic. I'm like, please, please, like, can I, and I have your tights, like my warm up starts in, in four minutes. Um, but that was a little bit of a segue. But I think, you know, the advice is that this is an incredible moment. You've, you've trained really hard for this. Uh, be in your body, breathe, and in, enjoy this special moment. You're competing in your first Olympic Games in the US. Your family's here, your friends are here. Um, and 
10 years from now, 20 years from now, you will marvel at what you did. Because now when I go back and I try to skate again, um, I can't do 98% of what I used to do. Um, so I think having a little perspective and appreciation for all the work you've put in and what you can do because of it, I think is, is an important reminder. And I think it's also grounding and I think it, it builds confidence. Great, thank you so much. And we'll go to our final question. Um, it comes from Troy, who you met earlier as well. Hey, Troy. Uh, hi. All right, so my question for you is, oh, wait, oh, oh sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, I would like to thank you for being a whole school time speaker today. Absolutely. And my question for you is, how has being a dedicated and disciplined, as a disciplined, disciplined figure skater at such a young age made your childhood a unique experience? And how do you think it's in influenced your work ethic as an adult? So as I mentioned, I was a pretty wild, distracted kid. I went through three different elementary schools because I couldn't sit still. I couldn't listen or pay attention. Um, one teacher thought I was deaf because I never listened. You know, another one gave my mom a book on juvenile delinquents because I was just you know, she'd say it was time for math, but I wouldn't put down my art project because it wasn't finished. And, you know, I would accidentally be talking to someone next to me. And so I would get sent to the principal's office. Um, so I, I had a very tough time, I think, fitting into a normal school environment. Um, and, and so I found a sense of discipline and focus in skating. It was something where I could channel my energy and it was this solo endeavor that that suited, I think, where I was at mentally at the time and physically how I needed to express myself and not only the athletic component of figure skating, but the artistic component. And I loved music. I loved to choreograph. And so it allowed me to have both. Um, and OK, the sacrifice. And so for me, it didn't really feel like sacrifice because I felt like I was finding a home where I fit. And I think I fit in on the ice and training and being creative, whereas earlier in my life, I didn't fit in as well in school. I think it wasn't until I went to Columbia a little bit later on and found this cohort of students that, you know, some were veterans who had just come back from Afghanistan. And some were professional Broadway singers and dancers. And all of a sudden, we were this group of misfits um, that suddenly fit in under this umbrella of general studies and all bounded by this common interest of what we wanted to do later in life. And, and that was to get an education. Um, but, but I will say, you know, it, it is was tough on Saturdays and Sundays when I'd wake up really early in the morning and I would just want to sleep in and just get a donut and go to the beach. And I knew that I had to get up really early, drive an hour and a half to the rink that was open, bundle up really warm, and then get myself warmed up for an hour before I got on the ice and know that I would have to do a few run throughs. So I think those were the really tough moments when I just wish that the Zamboni would break, which is the machine that cleans the ice um, so that they would close the rink for the day and I could just have a day off you know there, there's always I think moments like that but it's I think when you rise to those moments and you move past them you get up you show up you do your programs and then you go home feeling amazing there was nothing as spectacular as going home on that Saturday or Sunday knowing that I did the program that was so difficult and you just feel so light and, and I think that's a, a great metaphor for everything in life it's the hardest things that we do, whether it's writing a paper that seems super daunting. Um, when you finish it, when you turn it in, you just are really proud that you push yourself through it. And it's much better than never having done it at all. Wow, thank you so much, Sasha. We wish we could spend the whole morning with you, but um, we'll wrap things up. Uh, Tracy will lead us in a moment of silence as she always does to take in everything you've shared. And then Ivan will share some remarks. One, two, three.
One, two, three. Thank you, Tracy. Yeah, full disclosure, I'm not a Shakespeare scholar and I, I led with that, Sasha Cohen. I, the reason I know the quotation is that there was this book written by Chang Ray Lee, one of my favorite authors, and it's called On Such a Full Sea. And his protagon, protagonist is this, um, this uh, slight but powerful young woman who changes uh, society through her courage and and will and, and physical toughness. So um, that's what that's what reminded me of, of uh, going into the, the Shakespeare quotation that inspired the title on such a full sea. And you know, in the mid, we're still in this pandemic and really on such a full sea, we are now afloat. And it's people like you who are able to distill their sacrifice and accomplishment and, and challenge um, who inspire um, people like us. Um, to, to move forward in, in our own uh, individual way. I was, I was furiously scribbling when you spoke because you speak in, in epigrams and you talked about perspective and persistence and you talked about you chose political science because it's a narrative woven over world history. Um, and you talked about the gap between expect, expectations and reality and uh, about being in your body. And these are things that, you know, through the years, um, we try and talk about, but in a short period of a few minutes with you this morning, you were able to distill um, both in what you said and how you said it and this marvelous life that, that you're leading. So, uh, you know, I want to thank you for being um, uh, just a wonderful, wonderful uh, example of, of, of humanity. And then just, just how you balance things out. I, um, I looked at your op-ed and at the end of it, you said, and it was uh, directed largely toward uh, Olympic athletes or trying to adjust to the civilian world. And, it, and you said uh, that you suggested people learn to live for the process without being defined by the results. And that lies at the heart of our work here at the school, but I think it lies at the heart of striving humanity to, to stay in the moment, be in one's body, um, and not be defined by, by the results, but your results were Olympian. And, uh, and uh, it was just wonderful to, to have this process of talking with you and listening to you. And uh, thank you so much. And thank you, Devin, for this wonderful speaker and uh, this wonderfully accomplished person. And we look forward to following and seeing what you're doing as you move forward in your life. We're really grateful. I don't know, Sasha, if you have any final words for us, but I just wanna say we're deeply grateful for this time. Thank you so much. I feel like you always boil down and synthesize these moments in time that make me sound better. So I appreciate that. But I think that's also an important uh, parallel to sports and I think when you watch the Olympics this summer in Tokyo when you watch them next year in Beijing you'll see the um these highly edited one minute clips with this Olympic fanfare music in the background building up all this intensity and it's so important and this is the wave that these 15 18, 20 year old athletes are riding in on. And it's this huge moment. And we think, we think it's everything, but it is just a moment. And I think that is, that highlights the importance of process over result. Because I think something that I realized, which I didn't realize right in the moment, because I went home with a silver instead of a gold medal, were that athletes like Michael Phelps and Sean White, who had stacks and stacks of gold medals, also felt this emptiness when the result had happened, because I think we don't even know it at the time, but we do live for the process. We live for waking up every day for the human connection, for the goals that we set and for the way that we feel when we do these things every day. And so regardless of whatever result you achieve, if it's what you wanted or didn't want, when you no longer get to wake up for that process anymore, that's when you start to have to ask a lot of questions and find a new process, a new way of living, a new thing to look forward to, to continue to grow. And there will be many chapters, um, whether you're an athlete or not. And so the ability, I think, to adjust and to change 
as you go through these chapters um, is ultimately the enriching material that allows you to become who you are. So I guess I'll, I'll end with that. Thank you. That was beautifully said. Thank you so much, Sasha. This was such a pleasure. Thank you, Devin. We hope to see everybody soon, maybe in person at EHS. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. You're welcome, guys. Happy Friday and have a good weekend. Thank you. Bye.